All right, welcome everybody to research and innovation seminar, RIS, as we call it. Um, somebody is calling it RISE, but of course it's not RISE. It's, it's, there's no research I innovation seminar, there's research and innovation seminar, so it's, so it's RIS. Uh, here in studio, Urban, Urban Lab in Helsinki uh, are, are sitting we the hosts. Matti Hämeläinen from Forum Bibliom Helsinki, and also uh, innovation lead uh, of, of Finnest Twins project, I'm the search coordinator. So we are sort of representing the, the, the main setting that, that there is research side and there is innovation side. And the research coordinator is Dr. Kalle Toiskali, of course, forgetting to mention his own yeah, name. Yeah, I always forget myself. That's bad. But it sounds Simpsons. much better since I'm going to sell else yeah. refers to you as the doctor. <laughs> Kalle yeah. Kalle. So uh, for those who don't know Finnest Twins project, it's, it's, it's a quite big thing. Uh, 32 million uh, investment from, from European Commission uh, to put up uh, a smart city uh, or center of excellence, as EU calls it. Uh, now, now the center has, has already named Finnest Center for Smart Cities. And the whole project is 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 up to build that that center, that or, or among friends finest center. Um, so that's the purpose of of, of, of the project, and uh, uh, and 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 this risk uh, seminar is, is is supposed to support support that that activity. So we are we are presenting uh, things happening in in, in the project. Uh, and the, the thing is that, that in the project, there's a very strong research side, the 5.5 million uh, euros investment for, for three years. Uh, is it now second year going, something like that? Yes. Uh, and then there is a, a innovation side at the moment, having something similar, 5.5, something like that investment, but it's gonna be 15 million uh, uh, before 2026. And, and 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 these two sides are are perhaps a bit a bit separate, perhaps too too much separate because they should be in in synergical collaboration in 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 the future, uh, and that's why three sessions from now on, uh, and and so we are targeting uh, our large scale pilots. So, so all this 50 million euros happening in, in, in large scale pilots. Uh, and, 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 and so we, are, we, are, we try to learn what's happening there. Uh, and, 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 and so we have invited today a uh, lot of energy people. Here we have actually two uh, large scale pilots handling, handling uh, energy questions, the nicknames are DigiAudit and, and, and microgrids. It's too, uh, good to have short names. People is so stupid that can't remember many words at, at once. So it's very, very good to have these, these short names. Um, and uh, there are several presentations from, from these, these large scale pilots. Uh, and, 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 and then uh, we have a great panel, there, there are more. Uh, energy specialists there. Uh, there are people from cities and, and, and uh, there are people from research side. Uh, there are, well, I should say names. I always forget names. So, so from, from, uh, from Lani Harju, we have Asonetan uh, to comment in, in the panel. Uh, 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 and, and, and then Ado Altmetz from Tallinn and Janus Tam from, from Tartu. Uh, and then we have these researchers, Enari Kiesel from, from, from the center, from the Finnish center, uh, and then John Miller from Alt University. Uh, and, 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 and well, John Miller is, is a special person. He's, he's not a member of Finnish Twins at all. So we are happy to have you here uh, uh, commenting sort of pro bono. As in, an outside in... expert and outside objective observer. Yeah, yeah, you always reformulate things better than me so so uh uh do we all see the program i'm i'm not sure is it stupid for me to read it through or or is it i think it's visible in in all the invitations and everything but anyway we have kalle kusk from from digi audit giving the introduction 
and and then then Martin Talbert giving giving actually two short sort of more specific presentations. Uh, then we have this this micro micro grids uh, project, the large scale uh, pilot. We have Tarma Korotko. Uh, giving introduction, and then then Imre Drovdar and and Kar Kul are, are, are giving more specific uh, presentation dealing with that that microgrids, and 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 in the end we have thirty minutes panel discussion. So let's let's try to concentrate all questions to the to the discussion, unlike we usually do, but let's try if, if we can manage it this way. And for the general audience, uh, if you have any questions or comments in mind, please feel free to use the chat. We will be following up what's happening in the chat as well. And, and we will be picking up questions that we see relevant and direct them to the panelists. So feel free to use the chat for, for questions or comments. Yeah. Amazingly, we are still in schedule almost. <laughs> uh, so, so let's start. We, we have Kalle Kuhs presenting, uh, well, sorry, the, the whole, whole thing, improving energy efficiency in non-residential buildings is, is, is the, the sort of digi audit thing. And we had the great uh, uh, great title for, for our whole whole session. Do you remember what was our main, main title? Uh, it was about, um, uh, let's see, how to improve energy uh, efficiency of cities. How to improve energy efficiency of cities. That's our main title for the whole session, by the way. And last thing before getting started with the first presentations, uh, this session is being recorded. So just to know, whatever you say will be preserved in digital records forever for the generations to come. So be careful what you said. Uh, Somebody might be hearing that. Yeah. So without further ado, shall we get onto the program? Yeah, Kalle Kusk. Please. Good morning. I will give a short introduction of, of, short. of, of this large scale pilot called Digio. Yes. 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 We can see the presentation now. Yes, I will. And presentation mode. Good. Okay. I will give a short presentation about this uh, Digio audit project. Uh, more more detailed uh, presentation uh, will, uh, will follow after that by, by Martin. Uh, background of this uh, project is that uh, uh, property owners with large portfolios, like for example, local municipalities may have hundreds of buildings to manage. And it's uh, quite difficult to get a central overview about the situation of the buildings. And uh, for a single building level, the procedures of uh, energy performance calculations and uh, also indoor climate analysis are there, but they are all uh, quite time, time consuming and also uh, may, may be quite costly. So uh, for, that, uh, for that reason, it's, it's quite hard to have, a, have understanding uh, about the energy situation in, the, in all the buildings and also the status of indoor climate in, in the buildings. So uh, our solution for that is automated energy performance certificate, certificates and automated classification of indoor climate uh, estimations. For, and uh, in, this, uh, in this figure or graph, you can see the basic concept of our, our, our our uh, automated uh, assessment system. We have the data, data block, data is coming, uh, weather data and energy meters for and indoor climate sensors in buildings and also data from energy suppliers. And then we have this performance analytics layer with this cloud data store and uh, performance analytics. And we have a user interface where we can see this energy performance labels and also uh, uh, automated uh, classification of indoor climate and uh, uh, simple so solution is that if we don't have uh, uh, data or building con connected to our cloud data store then we can uh, 
have only energy uh, EPC level calculation. That means we have data from electricity and heat main meters and data from National Register of Buildings. Then we can issue a energy performance certificate. But uh, if the building have uh, uh, also, if the building is connected to our system and we have also indoor climate sensors, then we can have full scale energy performance and zero climate assessment. And the possibility for performance monitoring is uh, possibilities for, uh, after that, after we have connected the building are quite wide. We can have a portfolio view. So you can see basically in one, one page the whole situation of, of all the all, all the buildings also carbon footprint calculation room level thermal comfort and indoor air quality analysis and also identification of appli appliances that are that are not taken into account in epc calculations for example servers outdoor lighting hot kitchens and etc and also benchmarking and comparison with energy use with several buildings. And uh, also we can detect occupancy times based on CO2 levels and based on, uh, on the use of uh, HVAC systems. So for piloting, we have uh, at least 45 buildings, 15 buildings in, in Taltec, 10 buildings in Tartu and 20 buildings in Tallinn. And they are mainly educational buildings, university buildings, kindergarten, schools, and but also we have some office buildings and social care facilities. And the team for our project is uh, departments from uh, Talte, Smart City Center of Excellence, Department of Civil Engineering and Architecture, Department of Com Computer Systems, Department of Software Science, and also real estate office and also we have city of Tartu and city of Tallinn. And uh, that's a very quick overview of, about the project and Martin will go into more detail about indoor climate and uh, energy assessments possible. Project. The fin finished comes from Finnish, Finnish Estonian, as, as most of you know, but, but we have also to, totally Estonian things happening. Yeah, well, um, yeah, so let's, let's jump Paul, right away to Martin's presentation. Yeah, your, si your significant other seems to be health now. You don't wear a mask anymore. I try Good. to avoid. Good. I'll put Thank it you. when feeling uh, that I want to hide. <laughs> So, Martin, please uh, tell about the scales that you're doing this assessment in the school. Yes. So everything seems to be functioning now. Uh, sorry, wrong button. So uh, I will start this uh, uh, seminar uh, of energy with indoor air quality assessment, but it's part of our project. So I will come to energy also in the end. So uh, when we talk about indoor air quality, I guess most of you have heard that we need to measure uh, carbon dioxide levels in rooms. And uh, why CO2? So uh, here on this left graph, uh, we see that uh, the CO2 is actually uh, very well correlated to other um, contaminants uh, from humans. Uh, which are not so easy to measure. So if we measure uh, CO2, then we uh, roughly know uh, how many uh, contaminants or how contaminated uh, is room air when we talk about uh, contaminants from humans. Uh, also, uh, if we know the CO2 level, we can assess uh, what is the ventilation rate uh, per person. So if we have, for example, eight or 10 liters per second, then the CO2, uh, then the CO2 level uh, should not uh, exceed uh, 1000 ppm. But if we have very poor ventilation, then the CO2 level will eventually climb to very high levels. And uh, why are ventilation rates important? Uh, 
uh, here I would like to point out two, two things. So although this is in Estonian, uh, here we see relative uh, uh, study performance uh, as a function of uh, airflow rate per person. And currently we design eight liters per second. And if we go down to, uh, for example, four liters per second or two liters per, se per second, uh, we very easily get the uh, study performance reduction by, let's say, seven, eight percent or even more, more in worst cases. So what does this eight percent mean? So if over uh, 12 school years, you lose eight uh, percent or learn less uh, each year, eight percent compared to a school with good ventilation, you have to spend an extra year in a school to reach the same level uh, as uh, pupils who have gone 12 years to a school with good indoor air quality. Uh, the past years have also uh, uh, risen the topic of, uh, of uh, infections, uh, viruses spreading in schools. And here we also see uh, the probability of, uh, of infection of airborne disease, diseases as a function of uh, occupancy time and uh, again airflow rate uh, per person. And we see that uh, uh, poor ventilation uh, gives much higher risks of viruses spreading. And uh, current uh, approach is that ventilation uh, should be designed, or like future approach might be that ventilation should be designed that one event, for example, a school day or two school days, uh, if there is one infected person, the R of that e uh, event should not be higher by 0.5. And if we have 30 pupils in a schoolroom, one is infected, then the inv individual risk should be below uh, roughly 2%. So here we see that we actually need a good ventilation to keep uh, viruses from spreading. Uh, and uh, we, in this project, we want to assess uh, uh, indoor air quality automatically. And here is uh, a typical example from one school of, uh, in Tallinn, uh, how the CO2 level in classroom uh, changes over time. So here we clearly see the school days and unoccupied hours. And uh, uh, we also can uh, illustrate uh, or describe uh, the air quality uh, uh, distributed to different classes. And this green area represents class one, uh, light green class two, which is uh, uh, the level uh, where what is used to design uh, new buildings and renovated buildings. Class three, this yellow is still acceptable, but should be improved when, when, um, when uh, renovation works uh, are undertaken and class four is un un unacceptable. And then we, uh, uh, have to look at these levels. Uh, when I take the uh, same classroom and look at uh, a three month period from 1st of September uh, last year until uh, end of December 20, uh, the same year, we can see also uh, roughly the behavior that it's in general okay. Uh, we have uh, uh, mostly it's in indoor climate class one or two. And uh, we also see when there was uh, uh, the holidays and in mid uh, December, I don't know the reason, but uh, the usage of that room uh, dropped uh, significantly. Um, another thing uh, what we need to take into account when we want to do it automatically or maybe also afterwards is that we actually do not care about the indoor air quality. Nobody is in the room. So we only need to look at the occupied hours. And in this example, it was just assumed that during weekdays between eight and four, uh, we did the analysis. And in the bottom, we see the indoor air quality distribution into different classes. So if we look at all of this time, then we see that roughly 94% of the time, it was indoor climate class one and uh, by, by looking at acceptable deviations, we can say that it's like between 
we can classify this room uh, in the quality as class one or two. But if we only look at occupied hours, then uh, uh, we see significant increase of uh, duration in indoor climate classes two, uh, two and three. So this needs to be taken. So how, how do we automatically detect occupancy? We are working on this. Uh, so if we, if we have CO2 levels measured room by room, then we can use those values. But uh, as our project is also dealing with energy, if we look at the electricity use patterns uh, in, in buildings and uh, do some more thorough analysis. So here we see uh, the electricity use pattern uh, without ventilation and kitchen in that school. And this would also be used to detect the occupied hours uh, in, in that school. Uh, here, uh, I put uh, these uh, distribution to different indoor climate classes uh, to uh, of all rooms where we had CO2 uh, measurements. And uh, 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 in general, it looks quite okay. On the left, it's uh, with occupied hours. On the right, it's all, all hours. But here, there is one room uh, that clearly stands out with, with significant uh, uh, share in the red zone and also uh, the yellow indoor climate class uh, three. So we also take a look what's going on there. So this is the CO2 level in uh, that specific room. And one thing that, uh, at least to me, uh, uh, sticks to my eye is that the level never drops below roughly 800 ppm. And this is already uh, officially the indoor climate class one level, but in fact, uh, it indicates that the sensor is wrong. So uh, when we do this uh, analysis automatically, uh, we need to correct this value so that the base level is 400, which is roughly the outdoor level. But also, when I look at the daily uh, CO2 level increases, uh, according to class two uh, levels, the, the increase should not be more than 700 ppm compared to the base level. But here we also see that uh, during many days, uh, these levels go above this value. So this is like the virtual class three boundary. So it's still, Although the sensor is lying, the, the, the classroom indoor quality is still not okay. And then we need to do further analysis. So what's, what's the real cause? Is something wrong with the ventilation? Is the ventilation rate not sufficient? Or maybe the occupant density is too high. What we also have observed in the school is that the sensors do auto calibration. So this is measured values. So our system also needs to handle these uh, auto calibration issues. So to understand, when does the sensor or the automation uh, controller of the sensor change its uh, parameters? So to conclude this uh, uh, presentation, uh, CO2 level is a good indicator for real-time assessment of indoor air quality, but we, we have the challenges of identifying occupied hours, uh, interpreting uh, the sensor reading, which, which might be false, uh, then what do we do if we do not have sensors in all rooms? How do we assess indoor quality uh, then? And if we identify prob problematic rooms, are they overused or underventilated? And uh, application for this automated indoor quality assessment is identifying buildings that, that need renovation or, for example, somebody needs to go through and audit the ventilation system or HVAC system. Uh, also, in principle, we can uh, automatically assess the risk of viruses spreading uh, real time and also maybe provide guidelines or some, some um, uh, tasks how to behave in certain uh, conditions. And finally, if we uh, compare the operation of ventilation systems and occupancy, then uh, the, the uh, operation of ventilation systems can be optimized and energy use uh, reduced. So this was uh, the first presentation. And I guess since uh, we are now a bit more behind schedule, I will uh, go straight uh, to the second presentation. Please do. Please do. Yeah. Okay. Thanks.
So I will see if I can get this somehow. Okay, let it be. So uh, let's use laser pointer. So now we come to uh, more specifically energy and carbon footprint. So Kalle already showed some uh, some uh, sections of uh, the user base that we currently have on the portfolio overview. And uh, yeah, this is like uh, what we have right now. There are some errors. So clearly this is not energy cost. We, we measure megawatt hours or milliwatt hours. Uh, but what I will focus uh, on in this presentation is uh, sort of this table and, uh, and the energy use. So our current idea is to provide uh, uh, an overview of the uh, energy performance uh, certificate uh, uh, values based on measured uh, energy use of all buildings in the uh, portfolio. And uh, this should be illustrated with the uh, uh, energy performance uh, classes energy cost and also carbon emissions and some, some other um, uh, values. Uh, just I put here what values did we use for uh, CO2 emission factors. So electricity has clearly the highest uh, and it has decreased over time because of reduction in, in uh, of use of oil shale. Uh, district heat actually varies uh, quite a lot and it depends on, on the district uh, heat network that the building is in. So we have buildings in Tallinn, one part of Tallinn, then in Kopli, and also in Tartu and Viruma, where the, the district heat um, carbon emission factors are different. And natural gas is also like 0.2 roughly. So uh, how do we calculate uh, these uh, energy performance classes? Um, we have one building. Uh, we have energy delivered to the site. It can be in different forms, electricity, district heat, gas, uh, pellets, whatever. Uh, there can be local uh, renewable uh, electricity or energy production and exported energy. And uh, the delivered energy is, uh, is uh, the energy use of the building uh, minus exported energy if there is any. And then this uh, delivered energy is uh, multiplied with energy carrier weighing factor. Uh, for fossil fuels, it's one. Uh, for efficient district heating, for example, 0.65. And for electricity, it is two. And then this is divided by heat heat or conditioned area. And we get primary energy. I have also used weighted energy, uh, which is can be used uh, in case of measured energy use. And then this value that we get, uh, the unit is kilowatt hours per square meter is compared to the energy performance scale. So this is the scale right now for educational buildings. And if we, if uh, it's a nearly zero energy building, that means class A building, this value should be below 100. And it can go up to 400 or even more in worse energy performance classes. Uh, Okay, I'll oh, manage to get it out. So um, here is like very initial analysis of uh, uh, Taltec uh, portfolio. And here you see that the, the reality is that if new buildings are class A or should be class A, then the majority of buildings is class E or worse. And we have different buildings here. We actually have quite relatively new buildings. So for example, U06 was renovated uh, some years ago. And we also said it see the distribution uh, between uh, the in energy performance classes uh, based on measured uh, energy use. I have to say that uh, uh, this was just the average measured use of 2016 up to 2020, if there was data available and I did not do any climate correction or that kind of stuff, but just to give the overall uh, picture. We also see that, the, for example, the energy cost, there is a certain trend in energy cost and uh, carbon 
uh, emissions uh, of the building. And this building here, uh, DEG in Copley, uh, it has some measured energy use, but for some reason, uh, there was no data about cost or carbon emissions, but there was some energy use. So let's see if I can get forward. So we have two nearly zero energy buildings according to measured energy use without any correction of data. And these are these two buildings here. And uh, this is uh, our uh, newest uh, uh, building uh, that has uh, mostly civil engineering, uh, including also indoor climate labs. And uh, this was designed as a nearly zero energy building. And the uh, current measured energy use also shows that. Although uh, during COVID times, laboratories are, are not too actively used. So uh, we have to also maybe do some further analysis. The second one, according to measured energy use, which is a nearly zero, zero energy building, is this one here. And I guess everyone can see that uh, this is not an energy efficient building. It's just a building that is not used very actively. So I used to go to lectures here maybe 10 years ago, but as most of the campus has been moved to Mustama, then this is probably an underused building. And that's why the measured energy use is quite low. And uh, to really assess the energy efficiency of the building itself, we need to look at the energy balance uh, uh, into more detail. And I will provide an example uh, based on the uh, SOC building, uh, which has uh, uh, Taltec School of Business and Governance, but also a canteen, the IT department of the university. Uh, it has servers, also a garage with a ramp uh, with electrical heating. It was constructed in 2009, uh, which means that no specific energy performance requirements were set. Uh, for this building. Uh, it was designed during the high point of the um, real estate bubble uh, in 2007, when nobody had time to uh, really design uh, buildings. And it was constructed in 2009 in the bottom of the crisis, or the start of the crisis, where people did not have money to construct properly. So, and the uh, energy performance uh, class a certificate class uh, based on measured energy use only is G. So uh, here is the energy balance, partly based on measured energy use, long-term measured energy use, some short-term measurements, and also some uh, rough assessments. And uh, when we talk about this uh, weighted energy use calculation, if we have measured, for example, servers or garage, ramp, or kitchen electricity use, large kitchen electricity use, then this can be uh, subtracted from the energy use uh, used for issuing this energy performance uh, uh, certificate class. And this other, this blue one here, it includes plug loads, for example, computers, office equipment, then electrical lighting, uh, air handling unit or ventilation cooling, lifts, etc. And uh, here I have also in, in, in these uh, figures with these patterns, I have indicated these uh, energy uses that can be uh, subtracted when issuing uh, the from total energy use when issuing energy performance certificates. And uh, yeah, we can see that, for example, the servers, the top here actually can form a very significant uh, uh, part of the electricity use, but in general, this is something like this uh, at, uh, during different months. We also have to look at the district heat. And uh, we have here uh, uh, marked uh, large kitchen uh, ventilation supplier heating. Uh, this is something that should, in my opinion, at least can also be subtracted, which can be here, but we see that heat actually varies uh, much more significantly over the time. Uh, domestic hot water in such building forms quite small, small share, and most of it is uh, space heating and air handling unit. So uh, when we look at then the overall energy balance, uh, 
uh, this is the delivered energy, uh, like these warmer colors um, uh, in the, uh, show the annual energy use of district heating and cooler colors uh, indicate the different uh, uh, systems uh, using electricity. And I have used here again these uh, um, stacks with patterns indicate the uh, the energy uses that can be can be subtracted if measured. And in delivered energy, the share of between electricity and heat uh, is 50-50. Uh, but when we weigh to calculate the weighted or primary energy use, when we weigh it with these uh, weighing factors then electricity is roughly two thirds or maybe even more, maybe three fourths, and heat is then the rest. And when we look at the uh, primary energy use total, then if we compare it to the scale, it's very well in class G. If uh, we can subtract these, uh, these uh, energy uses here, then we end up somewhere in class F. So this is already a value that uh, represents better the energy efficiency of the building itself, not what systems are in there. Thank you, Martin. The, oh, sorry. I think okay. we need to move ahead in the schedule. So if oh, you can please sorry. wrap up for this. OK, this is uh, pretty much my last slide. But uh, if this rest would correspond to class A, then actually this extra use would bring us from class A to class D. So in case of energy efficient buildings, it's very important to look at these others. But yeah, thank you. So it, others can pause this presentation and look at my, my conclusions. But that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, let's continue on these uh, two good presentations in the panel discussion and, and uh, Again, the research results and the data, uh, are they published somewhere already or, or, or will they be published uh, or, or anyone no, who's interested I, in the details? Some, some of these figures were generated yesterday evening. Okay, so, <laughs> so I assume that. Yet, but... The latest <laughs> scientific results. So <laughs> that's why you need to be following these research and innovation seminars to get the most updated yeah. data. Right, right now our uh, biggest uh, task is to get uh, all these meters connected to our platform and then we can start analyzing and publishing. Better. Perfect, thanks. And, and uh, worth mentioning then that this uh, recording will be published uh, afterwards. So anybody who is interested in this particular set of data, they can check it out uh, in a few days online as well. Yeah. So from, from educational uh, buildings, we move to, to city uh, energy grid. Uh, and 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 questions how renewable energy or amount of, of or share of renewable energy could be um, increased. So so optimizing city power grids for increased renewable energy uh, uh, is 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 the topic for the next part. And 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 so we go to mic microgrids pilot and and then Tarma Karatko, please uh, give us introduction for this before, before two more specific presentations from microgrids. When... Yes, thank you. I was uh, having troubles finding the unmute button, but there. <laughs> uh, thank you, first of all, thank you for, uh, for uh, Martin and uh, uh, Palle, and also thank you for providing this introduction. Uh, yes, I'm going to give a brief introduction about the uh, pilot project which is dubbed microgrids but the longer and formal name would be the reduction of energy supply requirements using microgrids and energy storage uh, this is carried out uh, under the smart city center of excellence uh, with the association of the department of electrical uh, power engineering and mechatronics the department of software science both of Daltsec and the municipalities of Lanahari parish and the city of Tartu and the project is coordinated by me Tarmo Goretko um, I'm going to give a brief introduction about uh, what our project is about, and then my associates will give you a more detailed uh, insight into a few aspects that we are dealing with. 
So first of all, I'm going to discuss what is the problem that our project is targeting. Actually, there are two issues that we are targeting. First of all, the insufficient electricity, electricity infrastructure for industrial and also uh, public urban areas. This means that uh, municipalities, they uh, are, have reported uh, problems with insufficient electricity supply, for example, uh, for meeting the needs of industrial customers. So this means that uh, they need to introduce uh, large investments to satisfy the needs for the industry, while the investments are forwarded to the industry, which might uh, end up in the industry losing the interest altogether. So this is a problem that the municipalities are facing. And also the, the similar scenario could be uh, for uh, novel public services. For example, if there would be a public service uh, which would require uh, electric power, uh, it would require a power connection, but this might uh, end up being so costly that the uh, economic reasoning behind this uh, public service uh, would not meet its purpose. And another problem that we are tackling is the carbon intensive electricity production. And how we want to do this, what is our general aim? The general idea is that we increase the consumption of energy, which is uh, produced locally from re renewable sources, which will effectively decrease the amount of energy that is required from the larger grid. And also, if this uh, uh, electricity is produced from renewable sources, it will also uh, have a less carbon intensive, uh, it will be a less carbon intensive electricity production. What's our approach? Our approach is to use digital substations with energy storage from electrical microgrids uh, that form electrical microgrids that provide a viable alternative to the uh, centralized distribution and generation paradigm. And here I want to emphasize the uh, word viable. And behind this word are actually uh, different subsets of requirements. First of all, uh, such a system it needs to be easy to purchase and easy to install. So this is something we have to keep in mind. Another aspect uh, is that this, uh, we need to have a legal framework which uh, supports the operation uh, of such systems and uh, uh, enable the easy formation of such systems. And also a significant part is that such uh, systems or the alternative needs to be economically reasonable. Now, economically reasonable might not indicate that it needs to be uh, less expensive than the uh, centralized connection, but uh, it needs to, um, uh, we need to motivate the higher costs of such systems by uh, providing significant added value. Now, what might be this added value that we want to provide? First of all, uh, by enabling and providing novel functionality. And this is achieved mostly through the energy storage for providing flexibility, but also uh, by using digital tools to increase the intelligence, uh, overall intelligence of the system. And also uh, how we want to add value is by uh, focus on customer issues with power supplies. So for this case, we need to find out what uh, problems our target groups are experiences and uh, target the more uh, prominent ones uh, within our solution. We have partnered with two municipalities, uh, the Lana Haru Parish, which is uh, centered by the city of Valdiski and also the city of Tartu. And we have two pilot sites at uh, one of uh, those, uh, one pilot sites at each. So the uh, Lana Haru Parish pilot site is uh, what we uh, is describe as an industry site uh, where we want to show that uh, there is increased autonomy from the larger uh, grid to support the development of industry. And also the city of Tartu, which the pilot site is uh, this public urban area where we want to demonstrate uh, how we can enable smart city services through municipal electricity grids. What's the outcome of a project? It's a concept where we want to complement standardized distribution system hardware. So the standardized hardware uh, is meant to provide the easy purchasing and easy installation. Uh, we want to complement this with a software platform that enables the custom software applications to provide functionality inside the electric power system. So why is this important? Currently, if you want to see functionality inside the electric power system, uh, it is directly connected to the hardware supplier, but by uh, 
providing such an approach, we successfully can detach the software part or the functionality part from the hardware vendor. So this is what we basically want to achieve here. Uh, what we will demonstrate in our pilot sites, uh, four main aspects, the reduction of consumption peaks, uh, increased share of locally generated electricity uh, in total energy consumption, increased use, uh, usage rate of an existing electricity distribution infrastructure, and the enabling of smart city services through mun municipal distribution grids. To support the innovation goals that we have targeted, we have identified three uh, different research aspects, uh, which are uh, summarized in cybersecurity and cyber physical systems, power quality in electric or microgrids, and energy policies and local electricity markets. So this was a very, very brief introduction in what uh, we intend to do and how we uh, have structured our activities. And just to give you a more detailed information or insight into uh, our activities and our pre preliminary findings, uh, my colleagues Imre and Karl will provide you uh, insight uh, what is related to urban distribution systems and also closed distribution systems in Estonia. In the context of this project, the former is relevant to provide input to the development of the software applications and also for the composition of relevant business models. And uh, the subject of closed distribution system is extremely important as we envision this to be the most suitable legal entity for the operation of such described electric microgrids. So this was Thank a brief introduction. Karma. Yes, I would like to give word to my colleague Imbra. Yes, thank you, Tarmo. So let's move on with Imre's presentation without further ado. So Imre, whenever you're ready. Go ahead. Uh, you are muted, you're muted Imre. Imre. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Perfect. Oh, no, sorry for that. You. Now go ahead. Yes. So good morning. So my presentation will focus on the overview and the prospects of the urban electricity distribution systems. Uh, more specifically, I will give an overview of the of the two work packages, uh, work package two and work package four. Uh, for the first one is focusing on acquisition and analysis of information. So. We aim to map the electricity supply needs among the different electricity consumers uh, and determine the challenges for increased use of renewable energy. Uh, the second work package is uh, the research on the economic feasibility of uh, hybrid energy storage and increased power quality. And here we focus on the research and analysis of capacity reserves that are present in the urban electricity infrastructure. Both uh, VPs are strongly interconnected and uh, give actually a good insight to the possibilities that uh, this uh, urban distribution system could enable. So in work package two, uh, we, uh, we had a survey target group. We contacted approximately 19,000 companies in Estonia. And uh, the target group was uh, focused on, uh, on two to economic activities. So we have uh, commercial property owners, service providers, and manufacturing companies. The questions were targeted actually to cover a very wide topic. So the satisfaction of the electricity supply service, power quality issues, uh, the concerning uh, economic losses or, or damages that they, uh, they uh, see, and also cost-related questions and the general knowledge and readiness to invest. Uh, from the 19,000 uh, questions that we sent out, we, we have 205 answers received back. Uh, we had to categorize them actually into three categories. So we have the industrial consumers, manufacturing, uh, service providers. So we have real estate companies, but also we had to give an additional category uh, for companies who provide vital services. So we have, uh, we have healthcare companies, uh, DSOs, tank stations, um, uh, mobile service providers, and et cetera. 
the average company who who answered the question has an annual taxable turnover of 7.7 .7 million euros. It has an average 61 employees and 65% uh, of the companies are located in densely populated area. 43% uh, of the companies uh, actually say that they do not have issues with power quality. However, uh, if we presented them uh, several different uh, power quality related events and one additional this free form, then uh, 40, then everybody uh, have um, uh, found these issues uh, present in the system. And the three most common issues are voltage fluctuations, short interruptions that last less than three minutes, and uh, disturbance about issues in automation. And other causes uh, which have uh, been described are loss of uh, phase voltage and voltage tips. And the cost associated with these um, events is on average uh, 6,900 euros. If we asked about uh, how much would it cost if the interruption would last at least 24 hours, then 70% um, of the answers uh, or the company said that uh, they would have uh, direct uh, losses. Uh, the minimum average cost is around 17,000 euros per day and the maximum is uh, on average 75,000 euros. But it actually varied in a very large uh, 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 range. So it could be from 500 euros per day up to 5 million euros per day, depending on the company's uh, activity. Uh, regarding the renewable energy, uh, the survey showed that 74% uh, of the companies uh, do not use any kind of uh, renewable energy solution. However, 12% of them still buy certified renewable energy from the energy companies. 25% of the companies use uh, usually a solar PV solution and 1% uh, of the companies use CHPs. The main issues that were brought out uh, that uh, hinder the uh, wider usage of uh, renewable energy or investment into is, is the long payback time and uh, bureaucracy related to construction and grid connection. However, 58% of the companies are actually ready to invest in renewable energy solutions. Uh, the acceptable payback time is on average uh, seven years and the average investment that the company is ready to make is on around uh, 60,000 euros. If we talk about the capacity reserves in urban electricity networks, here we carried out also a survey among mun municipalities. Uh, the focus was on specifically the street lighting infrastructure. It's a publicly owned electricity network. It usually covers majority of the municipality's territory and the utilization is actually very periodic. So it's used only 49% of the annual hours and it's generally well overdimensioned. Uh, during the survey, we received uh, answers from 87 counties, and this cover roughly 26% of the total Estonian population, and 28% of the uh, municipalities were represented. Additionally, we carried out an analysis on the street lighting design principles for projects that were carried out in the last five years. Uh, we analyzed 14 projects. Uh, in eight different counties, and these included uh, 324 low voltage street lighting feeders. And the results were actually quite surprising. Uh, the general uh, readiness uh, to, to provide uh, new functional services uh, through the infrastructure, uh, we see that the majority of the answers are positively uh, ready to uh, do this. Uh, those who said no actually uh, require just a little bit more explanation because uh, it usually showed that uh, they do not understand how, how this is possible.
Uh, if we ask the which services uh, would they prefer or see, then uh, we provided or our this uh, survey focused on uh, two main topics. We had e and micro mobility, and local energy communities. And uh, there is a there is a big readiness to implement uh, regular chargers for micro mobility and electric cars, and maybe not so much for ultra fast uh, chargers. And uh, these are actually slightly hindered also by the uh, technological requirements. Uh, regarding energy communities, uh, uh, this is actually more uh, positively uh, answered. So to, to promote uh, energy community activities or integrating renewable energy production and energy storages, so uh, more than 60% of the answers are positively ready to do that. If we talk about the capacity reserves, then the average, uh, the average capacity that is installed in a street lighting uh, feeder is uh, 730 watts. And, uh, and the maximum is uh, 3.2 kilowatts. And the shortest line is 10 meters long and the uh, uh, smallest capacity is also 14 watts that is installed in one street lighting feeder. If we dig more deeper into the into the technical specification, then we can see that uh, the average utilization of the installed cable capacity is uh, is one percent, and it always remains below five percent of the installed capacity of the cable uh, current carrying capacity. The average uh, utilization of the installed uh, control cabinet capacity is uh, less than ten percent. And it is uh, strongly below 40% of the capacity. And uh, as the street lightning is uh, not used uh, more than half of the time, then this is actually a, a, a large uh, a possibility of uh, capacities that could be utilized for other services. And so, Emer, can you? Yeah. Yeah, Sorry. to sum it up. So. <laughs> So uh, Perfect time. Uh, we, we, we found that uh, there is a need for solutions that provide the relief for power quality related issues, uh, simplified the solutions for integrating uh, renewable energy. Uh, there is actually a business case uh, to see the losses that uh, companies are, are uh, having. And also there is a readiness to invest if it's local and if it's renewable. And the publicly available and underutilized distribution grids are a good resource to enable this. And that's all from my side. Thanks. Thank you, Imre. Well, then the last last one about closed distribution systems, Carl. Cool. Uh, we're slightly behind because of interesting content. So so. I'll the discussion to... part will be a bit shorter, or then we can extend it a bit. I'll, so I'll try to make it short. Ten minutes extra. Yeah, still ten minutes for the presentation. So yeah, I don't know how to do this. monitor and try to wrap up so that we'll have uh, appropriate time for the panel discussion. Definitely but no need not. to rush too much. Content first. <laughs> Okay, no, go ahead. thank you very much. I'll, I'll try to make it short as possible. I'll try to um, concentrate my slides. Well, starting with the closed distribution systems, um, it's important to understand what they are. And they are basically distribution systems that are operating in a geographically confined industrial or commercial or shared service site, meaning that business parks uh, industrial parks have their own uh, closed distribution systems. Uh, but the EU sees that they should have all of the compulsory technical co components of a DSO, uh, meaning that the technical side has to be of quality. But what might be the reasons uh, for choosing to become a closed distribution system is that you are able to procure your own energy from where you want to. Basically, if you have your PV panels, your gas turbines, then you can provide energy without being uh, in the 
let's say in the Nordpool spot uh, marketplace, you can directly sell to your um, neighboring uh, business building. Another thing which is an, ad is, is an advantage is, is that you don't have to go through the scrutineering of the uh, tariff, meaning that you don't have to explain your tariff methodology and how much you are uh, charging your clients uh, to the national regulatory authority. Um, you can develop your grid as you need at your own pace. Again, regular distribution system operators have to provide a list of investments for two years to come. Whereas if you're a closed distribution system, you can develop ad hoc, basically, meaning that you can develop as you want to. And ownership and development in uh, ownership of charging points is allowed for closed distribution systems, whereas they are not allowed for distribution system operators. So these are actually quite big advantages uh, uh, compared to regular DSOs. Uh, the reason being, or the reason behind uh, closed distribution systems comes from the Alps, basically, uh, where regions are apart or isolated by gorges and mountainous areas. Uh, but the EU has foreseen that this should be in the EU regulation as well, and we have tried to figure out in our study uh, within the Finest Twins Work Package 5 how would this concept fits into the Estonian um, non-mountainous areas. And we have discovered some use cases. Um, coming from the Estonian legislation, um, the Estonian Electricity Market Act has basically taken on the full EU legislation direct directives um, um, word by word, basically. The only thing that hasn't been mentioned or, or put into the legislation is the part about um, owning and operating um, charging points, electrical vehicle charging points. So that's the only differentiate, the only point that differentiates the EU legislation from the Estonian legislation. But it's an early stage. Everything can still be changed. Um, we went to the key stakeholders who we thought that the closed distribution systems um, should interest them. And, and one of them was the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communication. We interviewed them. And then we turned to the National Regulatory Association, asked their uh, input on what they see as the threat or not. And then, um, the steering committee asked us to also contact the Consumer Protection and Technical Regulatory Authority on how they see the technical side should be worked out in closed distribution systems. Uh, we contacted most of the Estonian DSOs uh, and asked for their inputs and, of course, business parks who have actually declared themselves as developers of CDSs. Um, the point of view of the Estonian legislators is that they do not see that there are any legal obstacles uh, to the creation of CDSs in Estonia, um, that they have initiated all of the needed amendments and the law is fit and right for the implementation of uh, both distribution systems and they should aid the Green Deal as well. Um, the Competition Authority uh, from their point of view, the possibility of implementation is welcomed. Uh, the competition authority actually likes grids to compete. So that's the main purpose of the competition authority themselves. Um, um, they did recognize that the tariff structure might uh, change uh, within the uh, regular distribution network operators, but time will show. So not, not many obstacles on the way. Now, if we turn towards uh, the um, DSOs of Estonia, uh, then initially, uh, by studying the description of those grids, uh, we foresaw that just a bit over half of them could be defined as CDSs, meaning that they operate in a geographically confined area. Um, Looking at their initial descriptions, um, they did not uh, service uh, residential areas. 
and thus could be potentially considered as closed distribution systems. But when we started interviewing them, information came out that they still, some of them still had residential areas uh, as their clients. And at the end of the day, only 20% of the current DSOs qualified, uh, would qualify as closed distribution systems. And those six DSOs, um, all of them stated that if they could understand the specifics of the procedure, procedures that they have to take to unregister themselves as regular DSOs and become closed distributions, they would do it in an instant. Uh, the main reason behind it because is that they would have ease of the scrutineering of their tariff harmonization process. Uh, for some of them, it takes three months, and for some of them, it has taken five years uh, to harmonize the uh, tariff with the national regulatory authority. Um, especially a, a couple of grids where all of the clients basically belong to uh, one owner. So they basically create, they are basically creating a tariff for themselves, which is unnecessary for themselves because they own the grid, they own the companies. So we could say 20%, but 60 SOs altogether. It's not much, but might be a statistic. Uh, then we, of course, turn to the biggest distribution system operator, Electrolevy, uh, who operates, I believe the member of the board can um, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but should operate for 95% of the Estonian uh, clients. And they have been quite thorough and they have been monitoring the process and we got a lot of good input from them. And, um, um, they stated that there was the, the, the lack of clarity in the regulation uh, regarding the rights and obligations and oversight of the um, closed distribution system might hinder a community's trust in the initiative. We understand uh, their fear as if a closed distribution system uh, goes bankrupt and lacks to exist or ceases to exist, then it means that the um, regional um, DSO has to take over that um, closed distribution system. And they don't know what quality uh, is provided. And that means that they might have to make additional investments that they did not see. So that was the main tone that they set. and. And we then turned to the technical authority and they basically um, diminished this fear in, in the sense that the closed distribution systems have to oblige all of the technical specifics that apply to the DSOs, meaning that technical availability has to be of quality. Um, but, um, but if we turned ourselves to one of the potential clients and actually industrial parks and um, business parks who are actually developing closed distribution systems, um, they said that they would like to officially register themselves. That was the main concern that they would like to register to make sure that in the eyes of the legislation, everything is correct. Uh, but the official response of the ministry was that there is no need for such an action. Just declare on your website, basically, like you're a CDS, and this is the uh, situation at this very moment. So, but but still, the ambiguity of, of legislation and guidelines on how to register yourself brings or has brought a degree of hesitation into their process because if they do something, they don't know if they will be punished by something, and but they are actually doing. Uh, the correct thing, but they don't know if they are doing the correct thing because bear in mind this is very new in Estonia. Uh, but the main Thank you, Carl. Okay, the main point was that the speed of setting up a connection themselves rather than waiting for the DSO uh, grid development procedure is the main cookie that they like regarding CDS is that they can be the uh, master of, of their own grid. Basically that was um, that, that was it as well. Ease of, ease of operation and reduction in operational expenditure. Those would be the main um, 
uh, advantages. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, uh, as, as, as we know, there, there, there are several cities participating in these two, two pilots, two projects uh, from, from Lanheri, Tallinn and Tartu, and, and, and I hope we have Assonet and Ado Altmets and Janus Tam here with us. Uh, perhaps you could comment shortly uh, your experiences or, or whatever comes to your mind based on, on, on these presentations. Please. And while getting into that, uh, we'll uh, extend uh, this session a little bit so that there's, there's uh, sufficient time for, for panel discussion here. Uh, please go ahead. Hello, uh, I'm Janos Tam from Tartu City. And uh, um, in Tartu, uh, this year we uh, approved our new uh, energy and climate action plan. And uh, one is uh, fundamental things that is uh, uh, to increase uh, production of local uh, electricity and also use it locally. And uh, this is a thing what is uh, not developed yet, but uh, where we see a great potential uh, to become a carbon neutral city in the future, at latest in 2050, but we hope earlier. And uh, we see the main tool uh, to have this is target uh, to create uh, energy cooperatives here. Uh, private cooperatives, uh, cooperatives uh, also cooperatives uh, with the city and uh, microgrids are a very good solution for that. Uh, the more that uh, in the city we have um, public lighting network, which is uh, underused. Uh, we use it uh, only in the dark time, but in the daytime it, it, it's unused and, and so it's lying uh, quite big and, and great potential, especially uh, for, for uh, microgrids and then for local energy production and, and also distribution. And uh, this is why uh, this, this um, uh, project and, and uh, this topic is, is uh, very relevant for us and very interesting for us. And this is why we want to implement such such things here in Darton. We see great, great potential on this. Janos. Then, Ardo Asso, if you have any comments. Hello. Can you hear me? Nope. My yes. name is Ardo Asso uh, from uh, Tallinn Strategic uh, Planning uh, Office. <coughs> and uh, uh, participators in the uh, DG Audit uh, project. And uh, uh, maybe only two additions to. Uh, to uh, uh, to Janos, uh, as uh, talked to, we also have a climate action uh, plan, and uh, uh, there are plan uh, about uh, 200 million uh, euros for investments into buildings in uh, private and also uh, uh, public uh, sector in Tallinn uh, for next uh, about uh, eight or, or 10 years. Uh, so good uh, pilot uh, uh, projects are needed uh, to initiate uh, this renovation uh, wave in Thailand. Uh, this was the first note. Uh, the other uh, also very important moment uh, for this uh, project is that um, uh, that uh, to the addition uh, the problems uh, uh, mentioned by by Kolebusk, uh, there are internal problems uh, for Tallinn too. Uh, and um, as we have seen during the project, uh, there are administrative boundaries between, uh, between city offices, agencies, uh, different uh, uh, schools, kindergartens, and so on and so on in Tallinn. 
uh, our information is uh, quite uh, fragmented. Uh, so it's quite uh, different to uh, to get feedback from uh, different uh, offices. Also, it's uh, it's uh, quite difficult to get the data uh, from uh, uh, different offices of Tallinn. Uh, so uh, so this project uh, helps to gather uh, uh, this information about uh, climate and ventilation in in school and, and city, other uh, city buildings. And we, th uh, we hope that um, that the system, uh, this management system of houses will be uh, uh, comp uh, comp compatible uh, to our new uh, planned uh, city dashboard project, uh, which, uh, which will unite uh, uh, different data from uh, different sources uh, from, uh, from, from Tallinn. Uh, so, City Dashboard is a planned uh, tool for collecting current and summary information for analysis and presentation to city leaders, specialists, and, and uh, citizens. So, sure. thanks. Thank Hi. you. Hi, I'm Amas Anetan from Lanaharu Municipality. And we are a partner in the microgrid uh, pilot project, and uh, we are very excited to be part of uh, this project because uh, uh, it's uh, I think it's a uh, it's a gateway to the future for us compared to Janus and Ado, who are the representatives of Tartu and Tallinn. We are uh, quite a small municipality, so in 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 the context of piloting, we're quite a good petri dish. And yesterday I talked to the owner of the pilot site uh, here in Paldiski uh, and, uh, and uh, we were talking about the project a little bit as well. And, uh, and the main big uh, good uh, result from this project in, in practicality for them is that they, they can get a competitive edge through this microgrid solution uh, in uh, providing uh, uh, smaller or lower electricity costs. And, and, uh, and as a municipality, we are hoping that in the, in the near future, in the future, that uh, we can expand this kind of um, uh, microgrids uh, to, to Baldiski in whole. And yeah, uh, we, we are, uh, Quite small compared to the previous speakers, but uh, our our hopes are as big and goals are as big as theirs. But uh, it's quite uh, a little more difficult to do these kind of things here. So, big hopes for the project. Thank you. Thank you, Asso. Right. Thank you. So we have our our research side, John Miller and Eric Kiesel. Uh, now it's your turn to give your, um, well, whatever thoughts you've got so far. Starting with John, since you're unmuted already. Oh, <laughs> I was going to offer it to Henry, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, thanks for these presentations and uh, us are small as good, um, both from Paladiski's point of view and also from Estonia's point of view, that it's there's less inertia in smaller countries and uh, I think Finland is another case in point, and I come from a small country called New Zealand as well. So uh, we could hopefully show the bigger countries um, a thing or two when it comes to the energy transition. I'm very happy that many of you have said that it's not going to come cheap. And I think this has been a bit of a misinformation from perhaps some of the renewable advocates that the sun and wind are free and therefore energy will be free to the end user. That's unlikely to happen. Um, but if we don't make this transition, the costs to the world and the society are going to be much greater. So I think you need to keep that in mind when you're convincing people uh, about the need to make changes. Technically, I've got all sorts of questions, but uh, that would take too long. Just maybe from the microgrid group, how do you define a microgrid? Um, is it a classical definition that it can exist on its own, seamlessly disconnect and reconnect to the grid? and sustain itself for some time? And if so, how long? And what kind of storage technologies would be, you be using for electricity there? Um, 
and the other maybe to the other group the one on the uh, building uh, uh, performance audit uh, I agree CO2 is the main kind of air quality uh, condition but there is a bit of a problem in the sense that the demand response reflex, uh, flexibility that we need from buildings gets a bit compromised if um, you have to run ventilation when CO2 levels pass a certain threshold uh, that's a heat demand uh, and an electricity demand that sort of is rather inflexible perhaps when you've got a given occupancy in given buildings so any comments on that would be welcome I could go on for ages but I think I'll stop there since time's limited and I can drill down a bit more specifically if you want a bit later thank you great presentation yes, I would like to jump in and just provide the more clarity regarding what we consider as a microgrid. So as you probably are aware, the microgrid is quite a, um, it's not a uni, uniquely uh, a, a term that is uniquely agreed uh, upon. So the, some of them uh, consider also the power grid of Estonia as a microgrid. Some of them consider a building as a microgrid. So the, the range uh, of understanding can vary. So for us, uh, it, it's more uh, not the size that defines a microgrid, but rather uh, some elements uh, that need to be uh, there and some functionality that need to exist. Uh, so for example, uh, we see that uh, uh, there needs to be one uh, control uh, entity or a control mechanism that uh, coordinates uh, uh, all the assets that are inside the microgrid. So this is uh, essential. Also, we see that uh, we need to have a source of flexibility. And in our case, it's an energy storage uh, uh, unit per se. And uh, we consider uh, battery energy storage uh, in our case. But we, um, as the um, innovation that uh, is uh, uh, coming from our project is this uh, software platform, we do not want to be exclusively connected to battery energy storage, but we want to be open for the future because we are not we don't know what will be the prominent energy storage in five years ten years but we want to be able to have this framework that if a new storage uh, solution becomes commercially available we are uh, can uh, uh, integrate this into our system very fast so the, it's actually the agility that we are uh, that we want to do and also the openness we want to make this electric power system open to uh, entrepreneurs researchers so that the uh, uh, transition from the lab to the operational environment uh, can be as easy as quick as possible. So just to give uh, time to uh, answering other questions, I'm going to stop here. So if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to contact me personally as well. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, thank so, you, Tarmo, for a brief answer and, and uh, hope that we can continue this discussion even after this today's session. Uh, so I'll take the question about ventilation and energy flexibility. Uh, as I said, one of the challenges that we uh, try to face or uh, solve is uh, understanding the indoor air quality in uh, systems uh, with, uh, without CO2 sensors in all rooms. And uh, that's actually most of ventilation systems. And if we can so somehow do that with some minimum number of sensors, in addition to the indoor air quality, and by using the mass balance equation, we can actually calculate the time that a um, ventilation unit can be turned to some minimum speed, and that can be utilized for energy flexibility. So most of rooms are not used or almost never used at design conditions. So there is flexibility. We just need to be uh, able to monitor the indoor air quality with enough accuracy to use that flexibility. Yeah, thanks very much. So mm -hmm. I'd be really interested to see how that goes. And I, I really like the correlations you drew between CO2 and infection and CO2 and uh, study performance and things like that. That was. Uh, that was some really nice uh, data that you drew out. So thanks a lot. Definitely yeah. very interesting correlation and uh, looking forward to seeing more data being produced by this pilot. So, so that's, uh, that's again, very, very interesting per perception into, into optimizing the energy consumption and energy use of buildings. Yeah. Einari, are you there? Yes, indeed. Right. 
Well, uh, I would just like to add in a bit of complexity to all of these uh, discussions that we had today. Uh, say, from the perspective of the Finnish Center, I think the main challenge there is also that uh, in the end of the day, both of these pilots should become also commercialized projects. They would be, uh, let's say, they would need to, to be in the way to the commercial world to be uh, also sold as uh, services or that uh, say, as the Finnis Center, we are looking also for the ways how to commercialize all of these uh, projects, both of these projects. And uh, the main challenge that uh, is, uh, say, with both of these projects is that, say, there is also a developing... And we lost him again. ...so attractive and applicable okay, he's gone. countries. Perhaps you could... Uh, Can you switch your uh, video, video off, off Enri? Yeah. Yes. So it goes. And uh, then the question there comes that, uh, say, if we say how uh, in the close cooperation also with the, uh, say, uh, legislation developers and uh, also with the stakeholders in the market, then we have to clearly understand what's the role and what's the focus that the, uh, these pilots can deliver. Say, we end, in the event today, we need that uh, these uh, projects will uh, fly also after the pilot phase and will be marketable in uh, not only in Estonian cities, but also in Finnish and the other European cities. And then comes also the challenge that uh, each in each country you have different legislation that doesn't fit uh, with the uh, neighbors. So uh, our uh, main uh, focus in, for the future is also to find the ways how we can create such a universal solutions that can be applied also in uh, different countries in a way that uh, it fits with the local uh, legislation and local conditions. So this is additional kind of layer that if you will uh, to think about when we uh, speak about these uh, projects and we have actually pursuing with both of these uh, projects also this commercialization aspect uh, in practice as well, that how we can be sure and how we can prepare these pilots to fly also after the official pilot uh, phase is ready. Thanks. Thank you, Einari. I think uh, that was very good question, observation related to, to the pilots. So how, how can we make sure that uh, the pilots do not end after this project is over, but uh, they are actually pilots for something bigger. And uh, uh, if either one of the pilots care to comment on that. Yes, uh, for us, it's uh, uh, actually what we have also uh, learned from, uh, from the uh, feedback that we got from different municipalities and companies, especially when dealing with municipalities, they, um, they lack in awareness a bit, for example, uh, in utilizing uh, and what resources they have and how they might be utilized. So uh, for us, it's very important that we can use this uh, Tartu example uh, as a like a demonstration case for other municipalities to actually show that here you're not confident it works. We'll show you it works. So this is actually one aspect that we also try to have when. Uh, uh, entering uh, or, or promoting our solutions to other municipalities. First, of course, in other municipalities in Estonia, and then we look abroad. So, but the, yes, as Enri mentioned, the legislation issue, this will be a challenge um, to come. So we will use Estonia case as a learning experience, and then we will try to see how we can adapt to different uh, legislation frameworks. Thanks. Yeah, so I can also address this most difficult question, at least to us engineers. And uh, we have had these discussions. And so how to have this platform that, for example, if uh, some real estate owner would be willing to maybe pay some 10 euros per month per, per building, that uh, they get what they need. and. Uh, uh, right now, 
uh, we are developing the user interfaces, we are gathering data, and we are soon ready to start uh, testing them on also on our uh, partners, Tallinn, Tartu, also the real estate office of Taltec. And I think it's very important uh, for us to understand uh, what are the questions that they want to be uh, want answers to. So we can provide very, very detailed data, but we actually, it needs to be useful for them. So we, we, ha we have to understand what they would uh, uh, use it for and then design the platform accordingly. And then this might, uh, let's put it this way, fly. And this is also another question from uh, like research point of view. Uh, I think many of you have heard the saying that all models lie, but some of them are useful. So our platform and models also need to be useful and uh, they need to be accurate enough. And the criteria, in my opinion, for accurate enough is that when the users of the platform get the information, they make the right decisions. And that's the criteria for accurate enough. They need to be, accuracy does not need to be 0.1%, but it needs to uh, support the right decisions. Yeah, thank you, Tarmo, and thank you, Martin. And uh, Martin, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that, uh, again, even within this pilot, you are demonstrating something uh, very quickly and very early on so that you can scale it up uh, even during the pilot project. Uh, yeah, and do you feel that you have achieved this? Uh, do you feel that you have uh, already achieved this kind of first uh, demonstration? Uh, mm. The data that you showed earlier is, is kind of uh, uh, demonstrating this to me or showing that, uh, again, you are already becoming credible uh, and demonstrating that uh, this way of uh, automating the uh, building data can happen in a, in a quite simple, effective way. Well, uh, we hope so, but we would have to show the user interface <laughs> to you and then you can say to us, but well, first we will uh, show it to our real estate department uh, and also to the cities and maybe, well, Kalle can also comment. I see that he appeared here. Okay. Yes, uh, we, we have very first prototype but we need a little bit more internal internal discussion. But I think in a couple of months we can show the prototype working. Yeah, yeah. It's always always good question that how how much you have to have sort of background research, basic research before you can apply it, before you can go to market, before you can you can sort of uh, have real real grip on 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 consumers. That's one thing, or well, perhaps we have no time to, to discuss about that. But the consumers, individual consumers role, role here, that's, that's probably the second large-scale large -scale pilot, hopefully. Uh, but, but, but anyway, it's, it's uh, Finnish Twins is still learning, so to speak. So, so, so these first, first four uh, large-scale pilots, and, and, and we have had two, two of them here in, in, in our session, and it's it, it's clear that they are very research intensive, as as Jarek Kurnitsky is is saying, uh, and 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 it's 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 obvious that that we need to sort of uh, in the future uh, have have even more 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 practical solutions from from the start, so that they really are pilots. Not, not not just research, but it's 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 uh, it's it's not your guilty. You have you have done your plans and 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 the project have accepted and then funded you and 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 you do as as you planned. It's it's a clear thing. Um, and well, and adding to that again, what, what is very important is this dialogue between you as researchers, research community, and the cities as as customers. So again, uh, uh, we. Uh, we're, we're trying to facilitate this discussion and dialogue uh, so that, again, uh, in an optimal situation, there would be uh, city officials who would be eager and just waiting to get their hands on on the proof of concepts that you're making so that they can start applying and scaling it up from here. Uh, and again, of course, as, as mentioned, uh, business opportunities should emerge 
uh, from the pilots and from the research. Uh, but again, hearing comments from, from uh, three cities here uh, today is also encouraging us as to move uh, forward with this type of demonstrations and, and maybe emphasizing this, uh, this proof of con concept on top of research and building on research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as, as as a side thing uh, for your for your actual uh, sort of results, uh, I think I think we need to map your experiences with 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 discussions with cities and discussions with with market or potential market and some sort of side activity uh, for, for, for well to to proceed with the center and for future purposes. But we'll be back with with, with that. I hope. And uh, as we are a bit over time already, uh, I'd still like to uh, give floor once more to John, as I kind of promised you uh, one more set of questions or comments since, since I could hear you writing down notes during the presentation. So John, if you're still here, uh, please. Well, yeah, just uh, a thumbs up to the chap with the English accent that was talking about closed distribution systems that's something that i haven't really been considering i teach electricity distribution and markets and it's something i should uh, pay attention to but there is one technical thing with closed industrial networks they can run with single phase line faults single phase to earth line faults uh, which you can't do in public overhead networks so that's that's a technical thing you can run with single phase earth faults in 10 kilovolt underground networks if you're brave but um that that's a technical issue and uh what else did i have um oh yeah just a general question where do you see in estonia uh most of the renewable energy coming from so for example in finland our simulations a few years ago suggested energy wise that it would be 80 percent wind and 20 percent solar energy wise in terms of installed power that's that takes a lot more solar to get eight twenty percent energy but um, have you got anything any clues about what is needed in Estonia and if it is wind it's probably going to be large wind parks perhaps offshore wind parks and how does that feed into your microgrid comp, um, concept yes thanks uh, uh, well I'm uh, I have the same understanding that the uh, wind is uh, mainly uh, large wind parks uh, either onshore or offshore uh, when we are talking about the industry uh, and also in the future maybe commercial and residential then uh, it is most dominant pv yeah. uh, so as we also saw in our uh, uh, questionnaire in our survey that uh, the biggest experience is with pv and uh, a slight uh experience with chp as well so uh yes when we are talking about the, the scale or the uh, custom segment that we are targeting we see the, the majority of pv okay yeah there are just a couple of things to look out for um one is that as we get more renewable um prices will sometimes go negative and that might affect payback times for also capacity generation as well as uh, photovoltaic and wind investments and then the other thing you've got demand response in your programs as well and I, I presume you're quite aware of the kickback problem so that when you t you sort of turn off loads and then you turn them back on again you might get a bigger problem um, so yeah that's all from my side but thanks for a really great work and that's uh, congratulations on getting this project and also with the chance for commercial you know pilot projects um there's too much work that's just purely theoretical but you know you've got a, a challenge there and getting data with the data protection problems that we have now is also a challenge but uh, stay with it and and i, I expect some nice results and i'll definitely follow your work thank you thanks thanks for the comments and the appreciation yeah, thank you john and uh Einari, same have... for you so do you have any final words or comments or questions for this in general? Well, I don't have any further questions. Uh, just uh, looking at the time as well, uh, I'd say I was just uh, very uh, encouraging for the 
uh, it, it would encourage you to hear that uh, both of the projects are actually in a very uh, say high end on the research side where uh, and uh, we can see that uh, there is a clearly a way forward with the commercialization of uh, of all of these uh, of all of these ideas and uh, with, without any further ado i would just uh, leave it to you to in close thank you also Enari. so all right let's wrap it up for today yeah how to wrap it up it's quite thank easy you. so thank you for all the speakers uh especially uh, since you're academic speakers we highly appreciate you being able to uh, to make very condensed and, and uh, high quality presentations uh normally given uh, a minimum twice the amount of time in presentations like this so so uh, i think the uh, presentations were very rich on information and and they were very clear and and again uh they were good foundations for for discussion during the session uh please uh check out the youtube channel for the finest twins uh this uh, session will be uh, uploaded there in, a, in the next days. So you can recheck some comments and some discussion if you feel, feel like doing that. And, and also hopefully we will be able to have some discussion related to these topics uh, on that YouTube ch channel as well. So thank you for all the speakers and all the panelists. Yeah. Last word goes for well, the, the, this has been the 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 thickest risk session so far. So so we have made history together. And and and, and well, sorry for the extra twenty minutes you had to spend with us, but it's never gonna repeat yeah. anymore. So at the Finest Twins uh, program, there are two more large scale pilots to be presented. So they will be appearing in the in the forthcoming research and innovation seminar sessions uh yeah dealing with uh, built environment uh and 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 mod modeling or, or green green twins the name of it and, and then mobility thing about mars and and automated vehicles and, and and travel chains and and all that so we'll come back to that yep but for now thank you very much thank you for staying through uh the youtube link is actually in the chat so so uh please click that uh right now and you'll get a connection to the youtube channel directly and uh mark it or follow us there uh that way you'll be able to see the see the following recessions as well yeah thank you thank you and goodbye <laughs>